But I think the one thing, Evan, that we're always focusing on is performance, not outcomes. What are you doing uh, to help people help themselves? When we say things out loud, they're almost 10 times more powerful than we think them, Evan. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Marlin the Master Show, where I bring on experts whose brain I want to pick and learn from, and hopefully through my learning, you guys learn as well. Special guest here today, Trevor Moad. He is a sports psychologist. He has been called the world's best brain trainer, and he's got a new book coming out called It Takes What It Takes, and I'm excited to get my hands on. Trevor, welcome aboard, man. Well, Evan, great to be here. Excited to be here today. Love what I just listened to, and Hope I can carry my weight. I love it. Now, now, take us around. Where are you? Give us a little tour. So I am in Manhattan Beach, California right now, right between uh, Manhattan and North Manhattan Beach. So rarely can I just sit outside and talk. <clears throat> so I figured I, uh, I would just sit outside and give everybody a little bit of a view. I love it, man. Is that, is that home base for you? This is home base right now. I kind of go between here and my offices are in Scottsdale. But okay. uh, yeah, so so excited. Um, been on the road like 21 of 23 days, so we've got a little bit of a goofy voice, but I'll do the do the best. Normally, I don't sound like a, a mafioso, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> you got, best you got the shades excited. on. You're crushing it. It's I great. got the shades on. I know it was. Uh, I got in it at about two last night from uh, from um, New York, so or, or St. Louis. So, uh, but I'm excited to be here. Cool. Thank you, man. Well, it takes what it takes. New book. That, uh, that's coming out. I'm pumped to get my hands on it. Talk to me about, I know you're the mindset guy and you focus so much on athletes. How does that parse over into the world of entrepreneurship and business? Well, I, I think for me, the, because of the, I, I guess, consumer-facing nature of the sports world, I, I probably get a lot more of my recognition through athletes, um, and particularly a, a, a five foot ten inch quarterback from Seattle, and then a uh, and then a coach out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which I was, you know, spent my time with eight, nine years. Um, but the truth is I've been uh, – really it's about performance. So whether it's venture capital or whether it's big business or whether it's Goldman Sachs or whether it's special operations or education or, um, you know, coaches, wh wh whatever it, it is. Yesterday I had a, a thousand coaches from USA Swimming. Um, hmm. Really anybody that wants to get better um, – for the most part, do similar things. And, um, and it starts with this great comment from Joe Madden, who coached the Cubs. You know, how, how do we learn how to do simple better? And I think that success leaves clues. Um, the sports world's a great metaphor. It's, a, you know, it's, it's interesting, Evan. I get asked all the time, well, you know, how do sports relate to business? I mean, it's the ultimate EBITDA-based business. Uh, and I think that's where it relates to entrepreneurship. Um, you are your own brand. And only the best get promoted. Um, the, 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 the firing rates, almost three out of ten professional coaches every year. Um, only 25% of NFL players make it to a fourth year. Um, so you're dealing with the best of the best of the best. Um, the industry that I work in within sports is not an industry. You know, there, there are no Tony Robbins in the sports world. There's a handful of us that have an opportunity to sort of uh, liaise and work in this world. Um, but it's, um, it's in, never an industry that's really grown. Uh, there's probably five to six programs out of the 132 Division I college programs and a handful of, of NFL and NBA teams. But for the most part, psychology means a reactive part. Uh, but I think in the hands of coaches like Nick Saban or athletes like Russell, Russell Wilson or Kirby Smart or, or, or a select group of people, they believe that the mind can be treated proactively and you can make great players greater and good players better, and that's where I've spent the majority of my time. So to answer your question, I think how it relates to entrepreneurship is um, uh, the social Darwinistic element of it, right? An entrepreneur only survives by developing a unique value proposition, a great product, and finding a way to get the best out of his people and enter the market efficiently and effectively, and an athlete has to do that, and they have a limited market window. When, when someone's coming to you and they know they want to play on a higher level, do they <clears> – <throat> Can they articulate the thing that's holding them back, or is that you pulling it out of them? Well, you know, I, I think there's kind of four levels that, uh, that my father sort of educated me on when I was really young. I think when people in any walk of life, Evan, um, 
you know, so people kind of start out at this level called unconscious incompetence. So they may come to you and they don't even know that they don't know. They, they don't know that they have a problem. They don't know if it's, a, if it's a skill problem, if it's a mind problem, if it's a physiological problem. Then you sort of evolve to this conscious incompetence, which sounds crazy. But conscious incompetence is essentially, at least I know that there's something that needs to get fixed. And it's, right. such, a, it's such a pivotal stage to get to that point. Now, in, in the sports world, we watch a lot of film, right? So if you were on the Seattle Seahawks and you just played – uh, Cincinnati Bengals this weekend on Monday, you're going to walk in to tell the truth Monday. And so whatever you did, good or bad, you're going to know. All right. And it's sort of like an earnings call every Monday. All right. And, and, and so you're consciously incompetent. All right. You know what? I need to get better at this. Doesn't mean you're going to do it, Evan, but the diagnosis is there and you accept it. Then you have, I think, a lot of people at this third phase called unconscious competence, which means they are good from time to time but can't really articulate why. And I get a lot of people, I would say, at that level that have aptitude, talent, that they've put together some performances, but they don't really know how to articulate it and how to sustain it. So really what we're striving for at any great program is conscious competence. This is what I do. This is how I sleep. This is how I prepare. This is how I warm up. This is my CRM software. This is my pipeline. These are the people that I work with. This is how I execute my plan. I may not always succeed. But I think the one thing, Evan, that we're always focusing on is performance, not outcomes. I, I think performance typically tells the truth. Outcomes can be deceptive. You can have a really good quarter, a really good semester, or, or, or two quarters, a really good game, and not do things right. Um, and you can sometimes do everything right and just get beat. So if your goal is performance, what are the things that allow me to succeed? Uh, in the long term, you'll win. Using me as an example, so I've got a YouTube channel is where this video is ultimately going to live. We've got 2 million subscribers, 300 million views. <clears throat> it's the biggest channel in the industry. Uh, I want to go from 2 million to 10 million. At the rate that we're growing, it's not fast enough. You know, gaining 1,000, 2,000 new subscribers a day is awesome, but, but it's just going to take too long to get there. Every major growth I've had in my business has come from me experiencing a major growth myself. And then I take that to my business. I could, if you, if you said, Evan, this is what you suck at, I'll go fix it. I don't know what I suck at that I need to get to the next step. Right. Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, that, that's, that's the ultimate question, right? So, so first of all, you know, how, how do you define who can you look to um, that's blazed that path before, right? And, and I think that, you know, I, I remember hearing a story in 1918 that they closed the patent office because they thought everything that had been invented had already been invented. So why do, why, why do we need to patent things? You know, so <clears throat> we're, we're going to be limited by our own beliefs. So I think, you know, how do you get to 10 million? I remember I saw an interview Drake was doing. Mm. And when he was 18 years old, he said he wanted to make $25 million by the, 20, by the time he was 25. And he did it, and then after he did it, he said he wanted to make a $250 million by the time he was 29. Well, that's different than a lot of musicians. You have to make different decisions if you want to make $25 million. Instead of just one song, you've got to go to Abu Dhabi and play for a prince. You've got to go uh, and get involved in acting. You've got to get involved in entrepreneurship. You've got to get involved in all sorts of other things. So it's interesting because I feel like I'm more of an incrementalist. You know, I'm, I'm more of, I don't mind if I go from 2 million to 2.5 and from 2.5 to, you know, or, or whatever it is from 2 million to 2 million, you know, and 10,000 and gradually work my way. And, and, um, but I think it starts with the big plan and then identifying what we do every summer. We spend about eight weeks at the college football at, at programs I work with and we start with the fundamentals of thinking. How does the mind work? How do we process? How do the outside people influence us? How do we influence us? Okay, wh where does the power come from? Do we have a plan? How important is our plan versus other people's plan for us? And that's one of the things I think is so challenging about the mindset nature is as I, you know, if I'm in a, a, a Hudson bookstore in St. Louis, Missouri, everything is mindfulness and yoga and, and meditation. And that's hard. You know, I, I, think, I think more of the success of anybody who's a really good performer is in the simplicity and I think it's your talent that takes over in the complicated. So for you, let me go back to the Drake part. You know, if, if it is 10 million, you know, then 
there's going to be a, and, and nobody's got there yet, then you're going to have to look for other people who've gotten there in different industries and, 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 and try to see if you can aggregate the marginal gains that they've been able to do. So is that uh, different segments of people? Is that, um, is that branching into different elements of your uh, topics? Is that different types of people that you're going to interview? Is that a different uh, external marketing strategy? Um, but your answers aren't going to be in this industry. Just like for me, I, I don't have a lot of answers that I can learn from the sports psychology industry because there isn't a sports psychology industry in sports. Right. You know, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I just, I think, um, you, you know, I think in pro sports, you have an infinite supply of talent. So why waste money developing them? If somebody can't do what they need to do, just go get somebody new. So who are you modeling? What are you doing to <clears throat> break out of your industry since you're already the best? Well, I would say I, I don't know that I would be uh, the best. I, I feel like, you know, Sports Illustrated, when they were, in, when they were asked specifically about that, I think that, that I might have been the only one those guys knew. Um, so that kind of be like the best player, badminton player in Manhattan Beach. But I'll take it. Because you, you know you're still you're still good, but the New York Yankees director of mental conditioning and the Dallas Cowboys Chad Bowling is is my best friend. We talk every day, so we're constantly uh, talking and challenging and pushing ourselves. I spent uh, yesterday with the CEO of MGM Studios. Um, you know I, I, I travel kind of all around. I spent a lot of time with uh, Ben Sherwood, the former president of ABC News. Um, I mean I try to spend a lot of time around really capable, talented people, and then obviously when you when you're, you know, spend a weekend around Russell Wilson and Sierra Wilson and those people, um, you know, attitudes are contagious. I can tell you, Evan, I've learned a lot more from the people I've been around and their greatness than, you know, anything I've done particularly. But I do think um, the quest is how do we make the information in and around our psychological architecture more clear? Um, and I think that's my goal because I was raised my whole life in it. And I think that the bigger thing I, I've probably learned over the years is that learning how to be less negative is by far more powerful than trying to force yourself to become more positive. Hmm. And I think less negativity is, is going to be the win for our country um, as opposed to uh, trying to create this anxiety by making ourselves go to an area that doesn't feel authentic. So, I mean, I was looking into your story and, and growing up, your, you know, your dad would play Zig Ziglar and all these motivational speakers and that started to get ingrained into you and you've been applying that over the basically entire career. So if I look at someone like you who, even if you won't say you're the best, you're, you're, if you're not the best, you're among the best. You're, you're at the top of your field. There's always a handful of one, two, five people. You're one of those five. For you to move into Instagram and, and blow up your Instagram account, that's been done. It's easy. You can model people. There's lots of people who you can connect with and copy their success and do it. For you to get better in sports psychology, what's the next step? Like you're already in the top five. The <clears> path <throat> forward is unclear. There's nobody who's miles ahead of you. How do you keep getting better? Well, it was interesting. A few years ago, I got a call from Maria Shriver. And... Um, you know, in my mind, I thought it was Maria Sharapova, who I knew for years in Bradenton, Florida, who was a great tennis player, and her agent's a great friend of mine. And um, so I was a little bit confused, but ultimately I went out to Brentwood, uh, California, and I sat down and I met with her. And it was really interesting. She said, you know, you were really hard to find. At, at that time, I didn't have Instagram or any social media because it's not really a requirement in sports. I've only really been on Instagram for six weeks. Um, because I think in the sports world, once you're in the building, you don't, you know, it's not about I'm this or I'm that and I've made $800 million, so follow my plan. Um, and, and I have nothing, there's nothing wrong with that model in and around uh, what I'm learning and seeing these uh, sort of thought leaders and influencers. It's just not how it works in sports. The athletes don't care about you. It's how can you help them uh, overcome the realities of the, the, their time and volume in the sport. Um, but Maria would ask me this interesting question. She said, you know, it was really hard to track you down, but you seem to be at the top of the field in sports. I run a program called Architects of Change. Instead of speaking to 150 athletes, I think you have a voice that needs to speak to 150 million people. Well, it was the first time I'd ever heard anything like that. I'd never even been, you know, a, a really around someone maybe like Maria. 
um, and, and for the audience, she would be uh, President Kennedy's niece and, and uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's former wife. And then in her own right, t- today's show, and she's done a ton of things and accomplished. And that really started me down this different path, which is why I'm talking to you, Evan. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't believe there's a lot more to do in sports, you know, because there's only so many teams. You know, I, in truth, I have been with a lot of great college teams and some great NFL teams and some great individual athletes. So I think in that uh, at that level, I've, I've been able to do a lot of cool things. There's certainly more I could do, and there's a lot more I can learn. I think the bigger task now that I feel is how do we take – the, the ideas that we've learned in the Southeastern Conference, in, this, in the sports world, that I believe are so much simpler. And, and as Maria felt, they're built for everybody, whereas so much of the mindset area now is built for the elite. You know, um, I need to read this book because this person went to Harvard. What does that have to do with anything? Right? Like, like, like uh, I mean, it's great if they did. Harvard's a great school, don't get me wrong. But... Um, what's the concept? What are they talking about? How does it relate? And, and it's not about the, the education of the person who's coming to you. It's about their experience and where they've been and who they've helped and who they've influenced. So I think the goal that Russell Wilson and I had in our own entrepreneurship as a, 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 the CEO of Limitless Minds is how do we get this out to everybody? How do we take this idea of neutral thinking and get it out to everybody? How do we help people recognize that their own language is the most powerful limiting factor in their life and that we always control what we say. And I think the last point I'd make, Evan, is to help people understand maybe what they don't do is the key to changing their life. It's not things that they have to do. But what they don't watch, what they don't say, what they don't listen to might be the key to changing their life as opposed to trying to add all these things while we're continuing to live in these limited behaviors. And people eat eight bags of Doritos and they say, oh, my God, I've ate all these Doritos. I better have three apples. Just stop after the fourth bag of Doritos. Right. It's funny you said that because I have a giant bag of Doritos. Let me show you. <laughs> it's on my desk. And it sits yeah. there. This is, this is like the half human size that you buy at Costco. It yes. sits there all day long because all I want to do is eat that thing. And, and, and I have a strategy called Damn the Doritos. Because I remind having that right here next to me all day long reminds me that I'm stronger than the Doritos. Yeah. Because damn well, the Doritos. It, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting. There was a great uh, strength coach in Vancouver. His name was Peter Twist. And, and I was at this Under Armour event in Bradenton, Florida, and they had Under Armour's kind of top performance people in this performance council. And, and when we, we started this, uh, this meeting, he held up a bag of Doritos in his right hand and the apple in his left hand, and he said, do you really need a nutritionist to tell you which is better for you? Right. You know, and he said, the question is, why should you choose the apple? And, you know, I've taken that uh, and gone everywhere, and, and you think about that question, right? It, it, people want to look at, um, okay, I've got to develop these affirmations, or I've got I've to go to my Headspace app for an hour. Just choose an apple. Start there. You know, and, and I think that that success is in the simplicity, and I love that you do that, but I also would say the easiest thing for you to do is not have the bag there, you know? Um, and, and, I mean, some of the statistics recently, you watch three minutes of news, you increase the probability by 27% that you're, you know, at the end of the day, you'll say you had a bad day, right? Well, who controls what I watch? Yeah, we're going to go into sometimes some work environments that are tough and that are challenging, but, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've been doing a lot of venture capital work here in L.A. Uh, with Upfront Venture Capital and, and uh, a bunch of others. And Michael Johnson, the Olympic sprinter, and I did an event recently. And I was just looking at some of the statistics on the Gallup poll. I mean, only 26% of Fortune 2000 companies are engaged. Their employees are engaged. 55% just put in time. 19% are actively disengaged. Those are tough ratios. One out of four engaged. I mean, they're similar sports. And then I saw another statistic in an eight and a half hour workday, the average employee productivity is four hours. And if employees dealing with any emotional problems, financial distress, divorce, it might be 1.5 hours out of an eight and a half hour day. And those are unique challenges for entrepreneurs or for CEOs managing these ratios. What are you doing uh, to help people help themselves? You know, yeah. and, and I think that that's, that's the number one goal that we, we try to do with the sport programs I've been in, give the players tools. They can be educated derelicts, but at least they have the information to be the best version of themselves. Right. They say the easy thing to do would be to get rid of the bag and not have it here at all. 
I have it here because it's difficult. Like I want to run in. If it's difficult, I want to do it. And maybe I'm just messed up. There's but, nothing wrong uh, with that. It, it's building your psychological stamina. But yeah. but I'm also saying that that in the absence of it, right? You know, sometimes we put this thing in front of us. Uh, you know, we can just, for example, like television. You, you know, just be in a different room or just not turn it on. If we, yeah. if it's on, we're going to probably watch it. And and you know. Um, Christine Porath, the professor at Georgetown, said that you know negativity is almost a multiple of four to seven times more powerful than positivity. And when we say things out loud, they're almost ten times more powerful than when we think them, Evan. So if if you just took that statistic, you know, at some level, you know, what we say out loud might be forty to seventy times more powerful if it's negative, hmm. right? So so. Sometimes the things that I don't say. What if I just don't say, I don't like working here. Now I'm not saying the alternative. I'm just not externalizing these certain things. And so sometimes I, I think like, you know, having that bag of Doritos or having that TV on or having you know any of those different types of things, I think becomes a really unique challenge for us. We're, we're, we're tempting ourselves in a way that that abstinence would make a little bit easier for us. But I love it. I love so, it. I'm not so, add a bag of Doritos. <laughs> Damn the Doritos! These Doritos are not stronger than me. I mean, that's people ask me, doesn't it? Doesn't it take you, take away your willpower? And for me, maybe I'm just weird. That builds my willpower. Just looking. No, at I agree. It. Yeah, so, I agree. So, so, so talking language, you you talked about it a bunch of times. I'm super curious your opinion. Uh, so for me, if it if if the answer to why I'm not doing something is scary, difficult, or hard, that means it's go time. Like that's not an acceptable answer. That means I have to do it. If the answer is scary, difficult, or hard, what what are the language things that people are telling themselves that prevent them from, and maybe especially out loud, if it's ten times more powerful, that is that are preventing them from having the success that they're after? Well, a really good friend of mine, uh, Captain Tom Chaby, who's a former commander of SEAL Team Five, and you know we spend a lot of time in the sports world working with the special operations community um, in, in a partnership. Around this program called the Tactical Athlete Program, and we learned a lot about psychological strength from them. They learned a lot about taking better care of their their operators, you know, physically, from mm -hmm. the sports world. Um, and one of the things that that he told me, I think, relates to your question. You know, he said the SEAL communities taught this concept: see before T. And when they're facing difficult situations, you have two ways to look at it: Am I being threatened? Okay, so this scary event, this difficult moment, is it threatening me? Because if I feel threatened, I physiologically will shut down. Mm -hmm. Or am I being challenged? Okay, because when I'm challenged, when I'm in a difficult situation, like, okay, all right, the odds are against me right now, it's a little bit tough, I'm being challenged, then I physiologically rise up. Mm -hmm. So they call it C before T. So how do I look at a difficult situation from the perspective of this is a unique challenge, I've got to find a way through, versus this is a threat that could really put me in a really difficult situation financially or personally. And so where I think language becomes debilitating is when we constantly talk about the challenge um, in terms of, um, man, I don't think I can do this. You know, well, we don't have the same things they have. They have better players. Let's take Russell Wilson, for example. Okay, uh, you know, football has metrics. Okay, and those metrics are real. And so a quarterback ideally is going to be about six four and a half, and probably somewhere around two thirty five. Okay, they're going to have uh, anthropometrics, which is their their arm length, their hand length, their legs, their, their you know girth, width, all that stuff. Probably more than anybody who's just listening wants to listen to. Um, but Russell doesn't fit a lot of those metrics, right? So he's five ten. Okay, so physiologically there there aren't any examples like you going to ten million. He didn't have role models. Right. Okay? So instead of focusing on what he didn't have, from a young age, he focused on using what he did have. And so many people, Evan, end up limiting themselves because of who they think they're not. Well, I'm not Evan. Look at how many people he has. I'm not Evan. Look at uh, all the things that, as opposed to, well, well what do I have? So, so for us at 5'10", he's got big hands. He's competitive. Um, he, he's willing to get up at four in the morning and study. He, he, he's got quickness and he's willing to train and go above and beyond. And again, he aggregates the marginal gains, how he sleeps, he prepares, and he uses what he has. 
And, and I think if we measure ourselves on the level of effectiveness we're getting out of our own potential, we would be stunned with how far we'd go. And if we stop limiting discussions, talking about what we don't have, what our organization doesn't have, what our team doesn't have, what my family doesn't have, what my gender doesn't have, all these different things, we're not pretending those things aren't real. We're just taking away their power. Neutral thinking is really a language. It says, when something bad happens, it happened. And that's, I think, the problem people have with positivity. And I'm raised, my dad was one of the first authors of Chicken Soup for the Soul, right, Evan? So I got a seminar every night at dinner, okay? Right. But what happens for sometimes when people um, are told to be positive, they're in a, a state that feels really distant from that. So in, in my mind, it was like a car can't go from reverse to forward without going to neutral. So how do we downshift and say, all right, this just happened and it wasn't good, or this just happened and it was, okay? But what I do next, not how I feel, determines what happens next. And, and that's where I think behavior becomes more powerful than emotion. And so many of us are regulated by emotion where, um, you know, when I feel like it, I'm going to do it. But, but ultimately, when you do it, halfway through it, you'll feel like it. And that could be as simple as mowing the lawn. You know, I, I, I'm, as you get out there, mother, man, I'm glad I did it. But if you wait around to feel that way, you, you know, you won't. I think to go back to your original question, what are the behaviors that get somebody to 10 million followers? Forget your industry. You know, what, what, what are those behaviors? And am I living in alignment with it? You know, Tiger didn't have any role models. People right. say, oh, Tiger Woods has all these gifts. Who looked like him before and who's looked like him since? It's what he did, not what he had. Love it. Trevor, thank you for the time, man. Really appreciate your insights. I can't wait for the book. Uh, it takes what it takes for people who want to buy the book or they want to dive deeper into your story. Where do you want them to go? Well, it takes what it takes uh, is a really cool story. Uh, and I want to thank Shannon Welch from Harper Collins. She had just finished uh, shoe dog and, uh, and unearthed me out of the uh, ashes uh, and tracked me down, which was cool after Russell Wilson and I did a show called quarterback to quarterback on ESPN but it's a Harper Collins. You can pre-order it right now on pretty much every device that's possible. Um, and uh, the forward is written by Russell Wilson, the Seattle Seahawks quarterback. Uh, and really is an exploration of how we came to this idea of neutral thinking and behaviors versus emotion. And it gives you some unique insight into some of the best athletes, competitors, and teams in the world and how those architectures were built and how that translates to regular life going back to Maria's goal. How are we affecting more than 150 athletes? So uh, I want to thank Jay Conley for the opportunity to do this with you today, Evan. And uh, I'm excited to uh, continue to talk. And you know what? I also want to say for people, listen to all of Evan's channels because I had a chance uh, last night to go down that rabbit hole, which uh, uh, kept me up late. But th there's so much great information and education. And I think education, gi giving ourselves, it's like giving yourself lottery tickets. You know, a, a thousand lottery tickets doesn't mean you're going to win it. You can win it with five, but it gives you a better chance. So I think what you're doing, Evan, um, is giving people a better chance to be a better version of themselves. I love it, man. So for the YouTube audience, we'll link that up, the book, It Takes What It Takes, in the description. And Trevor, thank you for, uh, for the conversation, for the wisdom, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply it in my life and business as well. You bet. Thank you so much, Evan. Okay, take care. If you want to see the one-on-one -on -one I did with Tony Robbins, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. It's not the amount of money. It's the amount of time. Mm -hmm. Time is your greatest friend here.